today, so... Oh, I forgot to tell you about that part. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Brad. I love the part about the cucarachas. Um, we've been in a teaching series in 1 John, and we are going to hit the pause button today. Uh, and we're going to camp out in uh, John's gospel and dig into some verses regarding the woman at the well. So l- let's pray for, for God to move Father, we thank you for your presence here this morning, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit will fall upon us, Lord, that you would show us things in your word that we've never seen before, that you would teach us, show us, and make us, Lord. We pray that all the glory, honor, and praise would belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I want to welcome you here this morning. It's, It's great to be back here on the island And I want to start with a question. How many of you remember the first time that you stepped foot in a church? Maybe it was a long time ago. Maybe it was a different kind of church. Maybe they played different music. Maybe uh, the, the environment was a bit different. Maybe for some of you it's more recent. And maybe for some today it's the very first time and you're already scanning the sanctuary looking for an escape route in case things get really weird. (laughs) There are times in church where you feel like everyone's just looking at you, doesn't it? There are times in Christian settings where you just feel uncomfortable, like you don't belong. Maybe there's something about you that you don't feel worthy enough. Maybe People would be disappointed if they really knew what was going on in your life. And the truth is, I've met a lot of people who feel that way about church. And today, most people are suspicious of or they're uncomfortable in church. Even if they're open to God, even if they feel like they are on some sort of spiritual journey, there's this discomfort. And here's what's so ironic about that to me. 2,000 years ago in the life and the ministry of Jesus, people felt that they belonged. People were not a disappointment to Jesus. Somehow they were just accepted exactly the way they were. They were, they were loved just for who they were at that time. And I often think, what, what made all of that possible? Well, I think it had to do with some essential values that Jesus had that were embodied in his life and his ministry of Jesus. And these are three of the things that I've noticed that were embellished in Jesus' life and ministry. One, everyone is welcome. Two, nobody is perfect. And three, anything can happen or anything is possible. And we at Christian Renewal Church, we want to be defined with the same core convictions as Jesus did in his ministry because we are a Jesus church. But between that ideal that everyone is welcome and that promise that anything has happened, we need to confront, confront this truth that nobody is perfect. And I want to ask you, uh, are, are you willing to accept that truth about yourself? Am I willing to accept that truth about myself? Because that is what we are going to see in our story this morning about the woman at the well. She felt like she didn't belong. Her, her checkered past had everyone sneering at her in judgment. Listen, she knew that she wasn't perfect. But she also knew that she ultimately belonged somewhere. And more importantly, she ultimately knew she belonged to someone. And that's when she met Jesus. The scholar Dr. Richard Phillips says that the woman at the well is actually the first person truly to be born again in the Gospel of John. She came to the well a worldly woman ignorant of saving truth, and only concerned with the material need of getting water. But she went back to her village, transformed with truth and life. 
What made her change? She had met Jesus and seen his divine glory. And the result was living water swelling up in her heart unto, unto eternal life. But the Samaritan woman's heart was not the only one to be taught by Jesus that day. While her dramatic transformation was taking place, Jesus' disciples were in the city of Sychar getting food. And when they returned, they had missed most of the conversation between Jesus and the woman. But they got there for the finale. And John tells us in verse 27 of chapter 4, it says, just then his disciples came back. And they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? You see, the disciples thought only in terms of the stifling social convention of their time and could not see the spiritual transformation that was taking place. They couldn't imagine a sinner becoming a saint. They, and they were skeptical, particularly skeptical about a Gentile being accepted into the people of God, let alone a Gentile woman. They were surprised by grace. Indeed, dismayed or appalled by grace might be more accurate. Their minds were affixed to the social status quo rather than the groundbreaking, ground-shaking effects of Jesus' ministry. And John, who was one of those unspiritual disciples, tells, it, tells us that they wanted to challenge Jesus. He said, why are you speaking to her? This is always, always how dead religion responds to grace. They start asking questions. Had they asked, Jesus would have said to give her living water. But the disciples' mouths were stopped, whether by astonishment or by the Lord himself, we don't know. We're not told here. But they were not permitted to desecrate this holy occasion of someone being lost but now found. So let's read our text. We're in John chapter 4. I'm just going to read four little verses beginning at verse 27. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, why do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman le then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me everything I've done. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to them. Now, this portion of the story raises... Some important questions for those who are sincere in leading people to Christ. How do we know a person is truly born again? And like the woman at the well and people today that we witness to, how do we know that they've truly given their lives to Christ? When you're in the Gospels and you notice in chapter 3, we saw that the new birth is known by its effects. Remember, Jesus said, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound, but you do not know where it came from or where it is going. So it is with those born in the Spirit. So just as the wind is seen by its effects, the new birth has necessary consequences that always occur and by which we may know that we or others have been saved. In John's narrative this morning, he points out three essential truths of salvation that every single one of us must know. Are you ready? The first one is a confession of faith in Christ. When, when a doctor delivers a baby, the first thing he wants to hear is the baby cry. That lets him know that breath has entered into the lungs of the child and he's beginning to breathe. So it is with spiritual rebirth. When the spirit enters the heart, 
the new life he brings causes the spiritual infant to cry out, confessing his faith in Christ. Now listen, this is a matter of confusion often in the church because many people believe that the new birth is caused by our confession of faith. But the truth is it's exactly the opposite of that. Our confession of faith in Christ is a result of us being born again of the Holy Spirit. It's a result. Jesus taught us, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Paul wrote this. He said, the natural person does not accept the things of God, and he is unable to understand them. So, until one has been born again as God's sovereign work through his word, he does not possess the ability to believe. But that does not make a public confession of faith optional to salvation. Some people think we could be secret believers, but the word of God never considers that a possibility. What does the word say? Jesus said, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will deny him to my Father who is in heaven. And here is where we see the main difference between Nicodemus, who Jesus witnessed in chapter 3, and the woman in the well, who we see in chapter 4. Nicodemus was a more religious person. He was a more moral person. But he left Jesus without professing faith in him. He apparently struggled with this until he actually saw Jesus hanging in a cross. And only then did he confess his faith in Jesus by joining with Joseph of Arimathea to take the body of Jesus. But the woman at the well, having beheld Jesus' deity when he revealed himself as the Messiah, responded with a public confession of faith that clearly reveals her new birth. Look at again at verses 28 and 29. The woman left her water pot and went into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I've done. Could this be the Christ? From her subsequent conduct, it is evident what she meant. She said, I have found the Messiah. And her public confession to her neighbors demonstrates her rebirth. Have you confessed Jesus before men? Have you confessed your faith publicly? Because it is important, just as important for you to do it spiritually as it is for that infant child to breathe and to cry out. Last week in Bluffton, we had three individuals who publicly proclaimed their faith in Jesus through the waters of baptism. And when they came out of that water to see the glow on their face, you know that they were changed. A confession of faith in Christ Jesus. Number two, a change in life. According to the Bible, a bare confession of faith is not enough to demonstrate the new birth. The reason is that the new birth, the new faith, is not credible unless it is accompanied by a changed life. Listen, it's it's one thing to say a sinner's prayer or give verbal assent to the gospel, but a true conversion will always lead to living faith, not dead faith, that bears spiritual fruit in a changed life of somebody. Let me show, show you and give you an illustration in the life of John Newton. John Newton was was raised in a Christian family, but his parents died at the age of six. And he was sent off to live with an unbelieving relative who mocked Christianity and abused Newton. 
So he ran away. And he became a sailor and he fell into gross sin. And after that, he deserted to live in one of the worst areas of Africa so that he can, as he recounted, sin his fall. There, Newton joined a band of slave traders. This slave trader treated him so badly that he ran away again. And he joined a slave ship. And since he was a qualified navigator, he became one of the ship's mates. And one day, he broke into the ship's rum supply. And he got so drunk that he fell overboard. And he had to be harpooned in the thigh by one of the shipmates to be brought back in. And during one voyage, as they were approaching a port in England, the ship encountered a serious storm and began to sink. And Newton went down into the hold of the ship and started to pump. And for days on end, he pumped. And in the darkness of his mind, he recalled the conversations that his mother had had him in an early age. And they spoke of God's grace. And they spoke of a Savior who, who died on a tree and gave him forgiveness. And these re reflections began a period of thinking about God once more that ultimately led Newton to be born again in saving faith in Jesus Christ. And Newton would be greatly used by God, a trophy of God's great grace as a preacher and a hymn writer, as revealed by both his confession of faith and his changed life. What about the woman at the well? What evidence do we see here in our text that she began a new life when she believed in Jesus? And John tells us in such a beautiful way. Look at verse 28 again. The woman left her water jar and went away into town. This reminds us that John was an eyewitness to these events because only someone who was personally there would know such details such as this. So what is John suggesting to us by making note of this? The first thing I want to say is how John uses the imagery of water often in his Bible, in his gospel. Jesus' first, first miracle was what? Changing water into wine. And the water jar at that wedding in Cana, they were used for ceremonial washings under the old covenant law. The same word is used here. So this water pot, water jar, was not a small container. It was probably a large clay vessel that would re require her to move it with great effort, whether on her hip or on her head. In John chapter 5, John again brings water into the gospel. Right there, there there's a, a, a paralyzed man laying by the pool of Bethesda. For 38 years... He's staring at a pool of water waiting for an angel to stir it so he can get in and be healed. On all these occasions, sitting water depicts powerless, outward religion, which Jesus replaces with living water of true spiritual power in life. This trend in John's gospel suggests that by leaving her water pot, the Samaritan woman was abandoning her lifeless religion and ceremonies and works. She had brought her jar to the to well of Jacob, but instead found living water instead of stagnant water. Jesus promised in John chapter 4, verse 14, that in you, a spring of water swelling up into eternal life. Listen to me. The water jar also suggests 
the overall emptiness of her life. J.C. Rule, J.C. Ryle says this, grace once introduced into the heart drives out the old interests and the old taste. A converted person no longer cares for the things he used to. A new tenant is in the house. A new pilot is at the helm. The whole world looks different. Listen, Jesus can take an alcoholic and make him apostolic. Jesus can take a pill popper and turn him into a tongue talker. Jesus can take a reefer roller and turn him into a holy roller. God can take a nobody and make him a somebody. He can take a zero and he can make him a hero. He can take an eight and make him a saint from the crack house to the church house. God, Jesus saves lives. If there has been no change in your life, then your confession of faith is doubtful at best. Again, the woman's water jar is instructive about the struggle so many people have. They are held back by some remnant of their former lives that they've not given up to Jesus. Some false source of comfort, some sinful habit or ungodly tr uh, ambition that they have failed to renounce. And if so, if that's a fact, it's keeping them from the kind of lifestyle change that will give them the joy and assurance of salvation that they ought to have. We as Christians need to walk with our heads up, confident that our salvation is secure, not in anything we've done, but in everything that Jesus has done. A confession of faith in Jesus, a changed life. Number three, concern for the lost. The third sign that this woman was truly born again is her immediate concern for the spiritual well-being of others. Again, verses 28 and 29. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who's told me everything I've done. Could this be the Christ? This depicts what is true of all of us. The day, the day of her conversion to Christ was also the day of her appointment as a missionary of the gospel. Amen. That is our mission. The Bible tells us that different believers receive different spiritual gifts. Some are gifted with teaching. Others are gifted with encouragement, hospitality, administration. But witnessing to the gospel is not just a spiritual gift for some. It is a duty that every believer shares. And more inevitable than that, it is the result of the overflow of the living waters that Jesus gives to whoever cries out his name. John Calvin observed this. It is the nature of faith that we want to bring others to share eternal life with us when we become partakers of it. The knowledge of God cannot lie buried and inactive in our hearts and not be made known to man. I mentioned John Newton as an example of a man whose confession of faith was confirmed by his changed life. But he also displayed a great concern for the lost. His most famous contribution was the hymn Amazing Grace, in which he recounted for millions the basic facts of his conversion and the salvation that they too can receive. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. That's my testimony, and I'm sure it's some of your testimonies also. That 
was the testimony of the Samaritan woman. Her zeal to tell the people of Sychar was particularly lovely when we remember that she seems to have been shunned by them. That was probably why she had to get her water during the heat of the day rather than be with the other woman in the cooler hours because they didn't want anything to do with her. And then the natural result of such rejection is often resentment. But having been born again, she instead showed concern for her neighbor's salvation. Moreover, we would, we would think that with her newfound faith, she would want to remain close to Jesus. But she was overwhelmed by the burden for others to learn what she had learned. That the Messiah had brought salvation to her corner of the world. And later on, she would spend some more time with Jesus because later on in the chapter it says that he stayed two, two more full days. This is the final proof of her new birth. First, she confessed faith in Jesus. Second, she, she began a changed life. And third, she showed salvation, concern for salvation of others by telling them about Jesus. And these same marks will be evident in at least some measure in all the lives of people who have truly been born again in faith in Jesus Christ. Emma, can you come back up? Let me uh, try to navigate this ship into the harbor. We, we should give, give thought to the words of the Samaritan woman that she spoke to her fellow villagers. Come see a man who's told me everything that I've done. Could this be the Christ? Listen, she had not yet advanced far in understanding but that didn't stop her for, from witnessing for Christ. And it should not stop any of us today. Instead of being hindered by what she didn't know, she went out and witnessed on what that she did know, that she had met a man who had been a prophet, and what is more, he had revealed himself as the long-awaited Messiah. This was enough. In addition to the obvious change in her life to bring people out to see themselves. Look at verse 30. They went out of the town. They went out of the town and were coming to him. Come is the great invitation of Jesus Christ. It's what he said earlier to the woman when he said, go tell your husband, tell him to come here. And she passes on that invitation to others who are lost. James Boyce once said this, the word come. This is a great word of the Christian gospel. It has brought peace to millions of restless hearts and satisfaction to many that were so empty and so lonely. So many great verses of the Bible contain the invitation, come. Isaiah wrote, come. Let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins may be like scarlet. He offers, come, anyone who thirsts, let him come to the waters, and he who has no money, come. And Micah, the prophet, foretold the gospel witness when he said, come, let us go up to the Lord of Jacob, that he may show us ways and teach us his ways. Jesus said to his followers, come, follow me. And he said, come, all you who labor in our heavy burden, and I will give you rest. And finally, in the conclusion of the entire Bible, the Spirit and the church say, the Spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. 
This is a hard truth that I'm going to say. You need to understand that if you are not one of those who do not enter into heaven, but instead fall under the judgment of God, it will not be because no invitation was offered to you. God sent his only son to bear the penalty of sin and say to you, come. And if you will not come, you will perish in your sins with no other offer of salvation to come. But simply to come to Jesus is to be renewed with eternal life and inherit an eternity of glory. Won't you come? And if you, and if you have come, would you confess him to the world? Would you submit your life to Jesus to be changed by him and become a witness who extends the gospel invitation to others so that they too might be saved and come also. Amen. Pastor Brad. In a moment.